Good morning. My name is Julian Fierres, and the talk today will be focused on, on biometric attacks. And perfect. can you see? And can you? Perfect. Perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Let's begin first with an introduction to biometric attacks. Um, this slide, I'm showing a general diagram of a, a generic uh, biometric system. So composed of a sensor, like a camera or a fingerprint sensor, any kind of sensor that can capture a, a biometric. Uh, so the, um, the general philosophy that uh, I advocate here, similar to, to others, when testing the security of biometric system, system to, to recognize people or to, to monitor people uh, for, for providing them some, some services. Um, this is similar to the, to the one picture here. So if we want to, to evaluate the security of, of an attack or the impact of an attack against the system, mm -hmm. first we will have to, to know about the attack, describe the attack, what is the attack, what is the intention of the attack? Uh, also, the system being attacked will uh, also assume, or we will have to to know the information that it's known by the attacker to attack the system. If we don't know, we can estimate or we can create a model of the information available uh, for the attacker, and there will be some data set for experimenting uh, the vulnerability of the system against the attack. We will have to describe carefully the tests to evaluate the attack. We will have to compute some kind of performance uh, measures of the success rate of the attack against the system and how the system is performing. And uh, finally, we will execute some vulnerability evaluation uh, in practice. So you can see that this is basically following the scientific method, method uh, based on experimental evidence in order to really study the impact of, of an attack to, to a biometric system in this case. And then we will have some way to, to report the results. For example, in terms of the percentage of accounts that are broken based on the information on, in the data sets and in the systems uh, assumed or, or evaluated. So this kind of methodology follows um, also um, some uh, principles and standards that are uh, being uh, and, and are being in constant evolution nowadays uh, we can we, we can take a look at for example common criteria uh, this is an international initiative that establishes um, ways and, and standards to, to evaluate the security of general uh, computer science and ID systems, and for biometric systems in particular, they describe very carefully different kind of attacks in a specific kind of documents dedicated to specific te technologies uh, called uh, supporting documents. They're, they have in common criteria videos uh, supporting documents describing attacks to biometrics, how to evaluate those attacks, how to um, measure the different elements of those attacks and the information available for uh, the attackers. And this is a kind of a more systematic way to evaluate systems, uh, in particular biometric systems, following the, the principles of the previous slide, basically following the uh, scientific method methodology uh, in step-by-step -step, uh, experiments. So let's take a look at, uh, at a, as a case study in order to, to begin the discussion. Let's evaluate the security uh, of a fingerprint recognition system against a very specific type of attack. And this is a direct attack based on stolen templates. So let's assume that we have a biometric system like the one below, fingerprint recognition. So we we were pre-enrolled in the system based on our finger. So we have in the data set, in the database, we have our fingerprint template composed of minutiae. And uh, now 
we can use the system to recognize our finger so that our finger will be sensed, some features, minutia will be extracted compared to the pre-enrolled template and then if this similarity is high enough the input claim will be accepted. So now let's suppose that an attacker uh, steals our template. So um, the template uh, in general will be following, will be stored following some storage standard. For example, from ISO, we have um, interchange formats and standards to store biometric templates. So for example, in this ISO standard, we will act, store to um, characterize our identity, a kind of a minutia constellation. And then from reading that uh, standard specification and from that uh, file that was stolen by the attacker, the attacker can reconstruct our fingerprint. This has been demonstrated in the literature that it's possible. So just from the minutia, this image can be reconstructed and then that image can fool the feature structure. In fact, we can go even one step farther, and this is from that reconstructed image. We can, uh, this is uh, an, an, a visual diagram of how from the minutia constellation we can go to a reconstructed fingerprint image that it's um, natural in, in, in the way it looks, and at the same time, the minutiae here are uh, very similar to the minutiae from the original template. So this image will fool, in general, uh, most biometric systems based on, on this minutiae representation. So, as I said, from the minutiae we can go to the reconstructed image, and from the reconstructed image we can even fabricate um, a gummy finger. And this is uh, a solid piece of good or silicone or other material that can be uh, inserted in the sensor, it can be presented to the sensor, and that uh, fake presentation can generate an image that is similar to the reconstructed image and then can fool the system. So we can go from the stolen template to a reconstructed image and then from the reconstructed image to really um, um, a solid 3D piece of material that can be presented in the sensor. So this is um, all the way from the stolen information to the uh, original um, biometric source that is fake. You can see that this is a fake finger, in this case made from a gummy material that can be presented in the sensor. And different authors have, have been studied these kind of attacks directly to the sensor uh, or indirectly to some in, inner parts of the system, to the feature structure, to the matcher, to different elements for different biometrics, like finger, face, in the last 20 years, in different uh, scientific studies and even big uh, projects. For example, in, in Europe, we had a few years ago, Tabula Rasa project, big project, two large projects where uh, these kind of um, uh, vulnerabilities against biometric systems for not only finger, finger, iris, face, most biometric diseases were studied in, in a lot of detail. So this is a visual representation of how from a reconstructed fingerprint image, we can get a gummy finger. So we print the negative of the reconstructed image. We print a PCB uh, with uh, oh, 3D uh, depth of the different ridges and uh, valleys of the finger. Then we, we use some kind of silicone over the 3D structure in the PCB. And then we, we at the end, generate uh, um, a, a plastic representation of the fingerprint ridges and valleys that can be put in, in a fingerprint sensor. So this is kind of manual way to, to replicate or to fabricate a fake gummy finger. So this, this is the kind of images that are, are generally obtained from real fingerprints over a generic fingerprint sensor. So you can see different fingers that are generating 
different quality and quality structures in the, in the fingerprints. These are the reconstructed images, supposing that the original image, uh, fingerprints were stolen, and then the attacker uh, generated the, these images from the stolen templates. And uh, the last row shows, uh, uh, from that reconstructed, those reconstructed images, we uh, generated fake fingers, hard pieces of fake fingers, and then we enter those fake fingers to the same sensors used here. So this is really fake material uh, obtained from fake fingers. So you can see, for example, that the natural uh, quality variations present in, in real fingerprints are not here, mostly because all these fingers are uh, generated with the same fake material. And in fact, this image quality level differences between real and fake uh, inputs can be used to detect fake fingers. I'm not going to too much uh, numerical detail, this is just uh, showing a representation of one of our earlier studies in detecting these fake fingers. So you can see some operation thresholds of a fingerprint recognition system. Uh, you can see false acceptance, false rejection. These are the error rates of the biometric system, which is very good. So equal rate will be around uh, less than 1%. And you can see the important columns are here. This is reconstructed image. This is uh, by attacking based on the reconstructed images. What is the success rate of the attack? So you can see that based on those reconstructed images, um, almost 100% uh, uh, success rate of the attack. So this is the attacker will almost always um, succeed in attacking the system, in breaking the fingerprint accounts, if we assume that he's able to stole the templates. And um, this is with the reconstructed images and with the direct attack, this is with the gummy fingers directly, the success rate is not as uh, high as the one with the reconstructed images, but still is very high. So depending on the operating point, on the security operating point of the system, we can go from 50% success rate with the direct attack to almost 100% success rate. So basically, this attack is very dangerous. If the attacker stole the template and then he's able to generate reconstructed images, he's able to generate fake fingers, so most of the accounts will be broken. So this is a very dangerous attack that deserves some protection. So and many researchers in the last also 10 years have dedicated a lot of, a lot of effort in biometrics research to develop anti-spoofing so countermeasures against this kind of presentation so how to countermeasure how to prevent uh, these kind of attacks to fingerprint but also to other biometrics so there are different ways um, one approach uh, would be to to combine not only one biometric but other biometrics, like multiple traits in multi-biometrics approaches, for example, combining fake with face, with voice, so even with two or three factor authentication, combining with pins, with physical elements. Uh, we can also uh, try to detect likeness based on the input biometric, so to really check uh, in some of the initial modules of the system if the input information or if the input um, evidence is really what we expect to be. For example, in case of fingerprint, is it this really a real finger or is just some material uh, faking imitated a fingerprint? And then that can be um, assessed in uh, different ways. Perhaps some using some special hardware in the sensor, some uh, thermic sensor, some uh, additional sensor inside the acquisition, or this can be also sold the likeness detection using software-based solutions. So examining some properties of the input images, videos, or signals. And this is, in fact, the likeness detection based on software solution, the most flexible and the cheapest 
because we don't have to introduce additional parameters, we don't have to introduce additional sensors. So this is this has been the approach uh, most developed uh, until now. Life detection based on software based. In this life detection based on software software solution, basically what we will do is to capture a training data set using one or several sensors and we will capture we will capture both real and fake data and with this real and fake data we will um, um, train a, a binary classifier so this binary classifier will divide the the input space for example the space of fingerprint images into two classes real and fake and for that that depends on the modality that depends if this is finger face or for different biometrics we will have different processing um, modules for example for fingerprint we may have segmentation we may have some features that we extract that are relevant for this classification problem we'll have some feature selection and then we will train our classifier and then we'll have a classifier that is able to uh, classify in, in, a, in a binary way between real and fake all these modules of course nowadays can be trained end-to-end -end using deep networks and this is in fact the usual practice nowadays especially for uh, face uh, face face fake, fake detection and this is for detecting fake uh, faces um, we will have instead of different individual processing models like here we will have an end-to-end -end, uh, network trained for fake detection So that was an example for fingerprint, uh, but we have similar studies in uh, the rest of the important biometrics like iris, like signature, and most importantly in face. Perhaps face is the, the most important biometric nowadays because of the applications and the amount of research and the amount of um, commercial impact of, of face systems. And face biometrics is also subject to, to, to different kind of attacks. Uh, when, when we look at, at the sensor uh, point in the system, when we look at presentation attacks, mm -hmm. we can have photo attacks like here, video attacks with sh showing uh, a face that we, we, we want to, to attack using some kind of a screen, or we can build 3D mask against this, uh, a face recognition system. And we have different different kind of attacks or mani man manipulations that can be used to, to take some advantage in an illicit way in a system processing phases. In fact, this is the motivation for the second part of my talk in defects. Defects is a kind of attack also to a system that is processing face information somehow. So um, face, for example, uh, can integrate uh, face processing uh, uh, algorithms, can integrate this kind of uh, face detection uh, and not only face detection but fake face uh, detection. This is uh, detecting the presentation attack online as you, as you saw in, in the video that I showed. Uh, there was uh, a 2D face that was printed and that was uh, classified as, as a fake with the red box uh, by using uh, an internal uh, binary classifier that was classified between real faces and fake faces. So as I said that that was the kind of um, biometric approach to, uh, to uh, assess vulnerabilities in, in biometric systems uh, and vulnerabilities around uh, the, the presentation attack. This is, a, uh, we have a running biometric system that is capturing, for example, face information to track the subject, to, to detect the subject, to recognize the subject. And that system um, can be attacked using different uh, presentation attacks, like this uh, printed face, like other uh, attacks. And that, that, that's a problem that, is, that has been studied widely in, in biometrics. And in the last a few, very few, uh, in the last two, three uh, years, there has been a, um, a, 
a growing interest in um, in studying defects. Defects. Uh, let me introduce. Um, as most of you will know about defects. Uh, defects is generally referred to any fake material content created by deep learning uh, technologies, especially looking into face videos. Face videos where, for example, the face of a person is um, copy and pasted, is, is transferred to uh, another video. And this is done uh, almost automatically without much human intervention in, in this process of copy pasting. So defects can be applied to the image level, so we can synthesize entirely uh, a new face, a uh, face that was not existing before, uh, based on, um, for example, GANs that can be trained uh, to, to know the, the distribution uh, the statistical distribution of, of the, the face of the natural faces so we can generate an entire new face just images we're working here in, at image level uh, based on input uh, faces we can also manipulate some attributes we can retouch some faces for example uh, you can see here new hair new glasses, uh, aging effects, or some kind of retouching, manipulating some attributes. And this is also a kind of defake, image defake, that transform, that, that changes that, that face. And in fact, if used illicitly uh, for malicious purposes, this kind of manipulation can be very harmful, as you, as you can see. So we should be able to really uh, detect uh, or at least have some tools to really check the validity and the, and the authenticity of, of faces and, and images in, and videos in general. Another image level defect is uh, morphing. Uh, so we can combine two real faces to generate a fake one. And that fake one uh, will be highly similar to both of them. So this with this fake image, we can fake biometric systems, for example, uh, this fake image will uh, pass uh, biometric systems for both subjects, and this is uh, vulnerability, important vulner vulnerability in face recognition systems. At the video level, uh, we have identity swap. Perhaps this is the the most uh, shown in the popular press. And in this case, what what, what what is done is basically we have an input video, uh, we have two or an input video and an image or two input videos and basically we transfer the one face to the input video. So you can see here an actor and you can see the, the same video of the actor but with the face of, of the second person. And, and this this, cause, this is extremely natural and on the level of, of naturalness of this kind of videos is really able to, to, to fool the human eye and many, many systems. And this can also, if used in malicious ways, can be very harmful. So we should be able to really know when a video is real or, or fake for, for many different reasons, as you can see. Is a reality swap. We can also swap expressions. In this case, for example, we have two input videos, and what we do is with the first uh, video, what we do is we change the um, expression a long time, uh, for example, so the, the, the first given subject is seems to be um, uh, showing the same expressions of the second one, of the second video. The same expressions and even the, the same content, the same um, text that, that, that is being said by the second one. So basically we're changing what, what the first person is saying and how the first person is behaving, uh, the behavior of the first subject in, in this fake video. We are creating uh, or a new material, uh, in, but looks natural as it was said by, by the first subject. 
The last one also in, in video manipulation is uh, audio to text video. Also, it's called in, in this research area, like face reenactment. In this case, we have an input video and we also have some input audio or text. And basically the input video is changed. So the speaker um, uh, speaks the uh, audio that is um, entered to the system or the text that is entered to the system. So basically, we make this subject to speak as the information that we wish. And this is also very harmful uh, if used for malicious purposes. So as I said, in the last two, three years, there has been a lot of research uh, in order to, to both advancing the uh, quality of defects and also the um, research on how to detecting these defects between real and a fake. So we can see basically two different generations. First generation of defects was uh, generated basically using computer graphics methods. And there were some artifacts that you can see here that reduce the naturalness of the videos. And in the second generation, this is very recent, uh, exploiting deep learning and advanced deep learning, we can see some fake videos that are extremely um, natural and, and almost impossible to, to really detect even to the human eye. So in the first generation of videos, so you can see some artifacts here. This is some synthesized faces were low quality. They were like a mask effects between the generated face and the, the rest of the body. There were some boundaries that are visible. There were some visible elements in the videos. There were some strange artifacts, for example, uh, along the, the videos. So there was, these are the some, in fact, artifacts and and problems that that facilitated the detection. So the, the detection was really uh, possible based on analyzing those defects. And in the second generation of defects, much more natural, uh, there are. Uh, elements that really make fake detection very, very difficult. Um, uh, we have indoors and outdoors videos, uh, day and night and different illumination, very realistic illumination conditions. The distance to the camera is not only f uh, close front, it's uh, very, uh, is variable in different uh, distances and natural poses, different poses. So you can see that here, the naturalness and the variability is really amazing for, for this kind of um, defects of second generation. So we developed a system in our laboratory for defect detection uh, using some state-of-the-art technology. Uh, using region segmentation, we extracted some regions from the faces, so the full entire face region and then region around the eyes, nose, mouth, and um, we combine two very good face detectors in those regions and combine that. So this is a, um, a good representation of the state of the art nowadays for defect detection. So for segmenting the faces, we used open face two and different landmarks to extract those regions. This is kind of following also a standard practice now. And as base models, uh, we used two very good um, deep networks that have been used for deep, de deep fake detection. One is Exception from CBPR 2019-17, and a capsule network that was uh, released publicly uh, last year. So based on dif these different regions that we segmented and these two base models, we analyzed uh, the different data sets that I presented from first generation. So you, you can see on the left and the right two databases from first generation, UADFB and Facebook Forensics, only 50 videos. You can see many different artifacts. Uh, and 1,000 uh, videos, you can see some artifacts. There's, this is much more natural than the previous one, but still there are some artifacts that make these videos not very realistic and also from second generation. These are very realistic fake, fake videos, CLIPDF and DFDC. 
and this is uh, the last one from a really nice initiative that is now evaluating um, from from Amazon and others uh, technologies for defect de de detection. So you can see around 500 videos, 1,000, and very realistic. So you can see here our results uh, in comparison with uh, also state-of-the-art systems by others uh, recently published. So in our approach, combining these different regions and as classifiers, exception and capsule network, we are able to achieve 100% detection accuracy in the first data set, almost 100% in the second, these two are for first generation. And in the two last generation, in, in the second generation, CLIP and DFDC, we are around 80% and 90%. 80 and 90 percent. So you can see that competing methods uh, are for second generation are around 70 percent accuracy in detecting the defects, and CELEP are around 50 70 percent. So CELEP is now it is still the most challenging data set. So we have only a detection accuracy around 50 percent detection. So what is the newest trend in detecting defects? Incorporating some kind of physiological information uh, in order to, to improve the defect detection. This is one of our efforts in this regard. Uh, by taking the videos, then we um, explore both uh, frame differences and the frame information in parallel uh, deep learning architectures that are able to estimate and to integrate information from the heart rate into the deep fake detection, uh, including attention to highlight the, this heart rate information. And by including this kind of networks uh, in the deep fake detection, we are um, able to improve even uh, more our results. Previous results that I showed by combining different regions are here, 83% accuracy, detection accuracy of the deep fakes for the most challenging data set. And then when we include this kind of physiological information, heart rate estimation, uh, to the previous one, we are able to, to achieve around 90, 98-99% detection accuracy in this very challenging data set. So this is an extraordinary result. Uh, and this is representative of what can be done uh, nowadays uh, using deep learning for deep fake detection, incorporating physiological information. And that's all uh, for my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And you can see here a summary of our main works in both attacks to biometrics and countermeasure attacks in general, and more recent trends in deep fakes and uh, face manipulation detection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, excellent presentation. And it's uh, we are taking advantage of the technology. Many many speakers decided to present the videos, and it's it's fun because uh, I I was uh, focused on writing in the chat while looking at the video, and I think it has uh, more flexibility. Yeah, I'm very, so, I'm very sorry because uh, a small part in the video uh, where I was showing some example of fingerprint attack and I was uh, talking over a diagram didn't show well. So I will upload my presentation because there was some visual examples of how to go from minutia template to a fake finger and that was not showing well. Yes. But, but no problem because I will upload my, my presentation we, with, we the, can... with the good figures. If you agree, we can also share it in the in the conference uh, YouTube channel. We can share the, the the presentation as well. Yes, please. I will upload the full uh, video, uh, including the correct information. Great, uh, and it's good to uh, to remember that um, uh, we will have uh, all all the videos uh, actually through the Quova system that I'm I'm checking right now from my my smartphone. Uh, we have the program. We have all the details. And also there is links to the videos right now. They are unlisted, but as soon as the uh, next week, uh, we will release uh, most of the videos. So everyone will have access to those videos and hopefully uh, we will uh, help uh, 
releasing this to the community so everyone who's interested in these topics uh, will have access. So, uh, Julian, we have uh, some questions. Uh, um, for example, uh, Sergio, Sergio Velastin is asking, uh, maybe you know, Julian, aside from faking, how reliable is the iris biometric? I have heard of some studies that show that it changes with age, health, condition, etc. What do you think about that, Julian? For iris? Yes. Yeah, I mean, iris is very reliable. Uh, in comparison to other biometrics, like finger, like face, I would say is the most reliable. But uh, it's a matter of two things. First, this is the intrinsic properties of the biometric. And for that, iris is perhaps, perhaps the best, as it has been shown in several studies, especially by Dagman. But the second important factor is how you acquire the biometric. So an iris biometric can be very robust and can be very useful if properly acquired with a high quality sensor that really guides the acquisition and then you can store a clean image. But if your acquisition is poor, let's say, in terms of illumination, variations, blur, uh, then your iris biometric won't be so strong. So in principle, iris, I would say is the strongest, uh, both uh, theoretically and also in large scale studies. There are large scale studies in different countries, uh, Abu Dhabi, Emirates Arabs, uh, in India, where Iris has been shown with um, several hundred million people experiments that was the strongest biometric. But you have to really be careful in your acquisition. If you don't have a good enough acquisition, then any other biometric, even a signature or a face with your smartphone can be better. So, so it's all a matter of, of having good quality acquisitions. Julian, I have a very, very uh, simple question. I, I have seen, we, we have flooded by these Hollywood uh, ideas of uh, biometrics. And we have seen horror movies and spy movies when they take the, the, the eye of the person and then they enter to the security system. So how, how real is that? Is it, is, it, is it possible to do something like that? Because that, that, will, that could uh, pose a, a risk for the security of the, of the people. Yeah, that, that, uh, that is a risk, but I would say it's a small risk. Uh, th there is the possibility even to, to take a, a dead body, uh, iris, the finger, or some even the, the, the face from a face body, and, and, and use that for a biometric system. But this is um, uh, depending on the biometric system. Uh, the system may incorporate liveness detection, and then the system won't be broken. And on the other hand, um, uh, the casuistic, the the um, um, uh, the, the real uh, problems that, that or, or the real situations that you will find, I think, uh, won't be easy to to happen. I know only I know only just a handful of cases, two three cases all around the world were really, for example, um, a car model, Mercedes, uh, in an Asian country, I don't remember exactly the country, but incorporated a, a keyless uh, open doors using fingerprint biometrics. And one owner had his finger cut in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to steal the car. So that was, for example, one, one case, but this is very infrequent that, that, that one can really be hurt or, or can use a dead body to, to, to break a, 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 um, a biometric system. And this will be only like uh, for very expensive or very um, um, uh, specific uh, systems. So the risk is there for any security system. So you can be also hijacked in your house to, to open your account or your visa card. So I, I don't think the risk in biometric systems is any higher than the risk in any traditional security system uh, all around us. So your house, your doors, your bank accounts, your visa cards. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid by this kind of uh, Hollywood, uh, very showy, showy cases. So 
important thing is having, let's say, a good service and good logins in our smartphone, in our computer, and biometrics for that is perfect. Yeah, and of course, that, that there will be also always like a, a side risk uh, that really very dangerous uh, attackers can really harm people. But this is not biometric; it's just uh, the, the way violence works against any 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 kind of system or any kind of security door that we can put. Interesting. Well, Paulo, Paulo from Portugal, he's asking. How easy would it be to steal templates? That's a, a case by case, an application dependent problem. So that depends. Uh, it can be very, very difficult. It can be impossible if properly stored and cryptographically uh, protected, then that can be very, very difficult for an attacker. In other cases, uh, it can be easy. So that depends on the final application. So, I know one case study, one example in where that, that reached our laboratory, it was a smart card, a smart card with match on card, match on card technology. So we have uh, just similar to a credit card with a, but with a smart chip. And there was um, no information about the card, just general standards. And we were able to really extract the fingerprint template using just general standards and just um, off the shell software. So that depends on how well is the information protected in the system at hand. For example, in the smartphones, it, uh, usually that integrate fingerprint technology, uh, it's very difficult because that information is stored in, in secure modules of the operating system. But some, in some cases, you store a, a face image using third-party applications, and then uh, stealing the face template is very, is very easy. So it depends. Uh, there is no unique answer for that. Yes. Well, in my case, uh, I bought a smartphone recently, and I didn't, I didn't have this uh, fingerprint option, uh, and that was the first time I had this. But right now, I, I feel that it's very comfortable. So I, I access my bank uh, applications, and I all, uh, I never put my my codes again, the numbers. I just use my finger, so it's very comfortable, and and I really have the idea that I can trust that. But yeah. uh, we never know. So yeah, some, can, sometimes we use uh, technology mm -hmm. that we think is uh, is going to work, but uh, well, <laughs> I hope I don't. Uh, for for um, biometrics. Uh, modules that are embedded in the operating system, for example, in login options using fingerprint, face, iris, usually these are very well protected spaces in the operating system. So your fingerprint templates, your face templates, your iris templates uh, are not available uh, to, to software developers or to the API of the operating system. So usually they are very, very, very well protected. In fact, and these are the templates. The fingerprint images or the iris images are not even stored there. So it's kind of password security that is hashed somehow, and you are not able to really steal or make use of that. It's it's something very very important, and that uh, a smartphone and operating system companies are addressing, in in my opinion, very well. A different thing will be like third party third party applications or independent developers that are, uh, are commercializing biometric te technology that, that that can be risky perhaps but not I, I would trust these developments for embed biometrics in a smartphone applications okay. so Ruber Hernandez is asking hello Julian we have focused our research on the recognition of palm and finger veins due to their high security as they are internal structures and their characteristics. They are very difficult to forge. Yeah, yeah, However, really. this technology is not extensively used because of its high cost mainly. Have you studied this biometric? Do you know how difficult it is to fake vein-based biometrics in real terms? Do you know the state of the investigation on the detection of attacks? Uh, did it, I know the technology, but directly I haven't worked on that. 
I haven't experimented in my research lab, uh, but I can point you to some uh, research on, on presentation attacks also to pain. In fact, there was a competition on presentation attacks to pain a few, two, three years ago. So not in my direct experience, uh, but I can give you some links. So Ruben, I will give you the links after the presentation. Great, and, and one last, last question from Luis Gonzalez. Hello, Julian. In your opinion, we should advance to biometric keys that contain non-static elements, such as a biometric recognition of micro expectations. For example, my password, close right eye, rise eyebrow, and look three times to the right. So I, I think it goes from the dynamic uh, part yeah. of the movement. Yeah, yeah. There has been uh, yeah, some research on this kind of interactive biometrics or kind of challenge response. So the system is asking you to do something and then you do something. And this is a stronger way and very difficult to, to really fake and to really attack this kind of challenge response systems. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the first anti-spoofing uh, uh, approaches for uh, face fake detection in, in Android was that the system um, the first face detections, face recognition system were easily fooled for a smartphone. And then Android entered a blinking option. So you were asked to blink. And then, of course, if you present like a 2D face to the smartphone or, or some other kind of uh, face that is fabricated, it won't be able to blink. So it, it cooperated like a blink detection. And of course, the examples that you said, like raising your eyebrow. This can be um, analyzed using uh, off-the-shell te technology and can be very useful to, to detect also these kind of attacks. But that's kind of um, uh, application technology. So uh, this, this, can be, this, can, this can be useful for, for some applications. So it's just a matter of, of perhaps finding a good market for, for, for that. Technology is there for that. And that can be useful. I agree that that, that can be useful. This kind of uh, interactive um, challenge response uh, in order to, to, to authenticate a, a biometric, especially in face and audio and, and voice uh, speaker recognition. Right. Leon, I'm just curious, you show the first generation of these uh, videos and then the second generation, there was a big difference. So um, in your experience, can you imagine a third generation? It's, it's already there. Uh, what is going on and, and, and yeah. it will happen soon? Yeah, in fact, uh, there will be a third generation because the deep fake uh, technology is advancing very, very fast, even faster than the deep fake detection. Why? Because deepfakes start also to, to find application not, not only in like funny videos. So for now, deepfakes are just like funny videos. But even uh, big companies like Disney, like producers of uh, media content are looking at deepfakes. For example, to, 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 to come to life again, like dead actors or like using this information to really create um, uh, mass media. Uh, so they're putting a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of you know, brains to work on uh, better defects and cleaner. And for example, just taking videos that we had from you know, 200 uh, year old, um, I don't know, um, distinguished, uh, or a famous person and, and make, I don't know, uh, or just from, from a few images, we want to make uh, come to life uh, Newton, for example. We have some draw, drawings and then perhaps we using this sophisticated technology we can have. So it's not a matter of playing and creating funny videos. It's just um, a technology, I think, that will be present here to, to create new kinds of media that will be consumed by a lot of people, created by big companies. So defects will continue to evolve and to be better. For example, uh, including also this kind of physiological in information, sweating information, 
reflections, uh, illumination, so naturalness of the muscles in the, so if, I don't know if you, you saw the, one of the last movies, uh, the Irish, I think, uh, with um, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. And that, that was not the fakes, that was kind of a graphical artist doing this conversion that, and they crossed generations between actors. So 20, 30 years old. So I think deep fakes will evolve, will make better and better. And if uh, for good purposes, for creating nice, good material that, that we can enjoy, but at the same time, those materials and the technologies can be used for malicious purposes. And then defect technology will, for detecting these defects, will have to evolve also. That, that, that's a, those are wonderful news because I, I will, in the future, I will sell my pictures so I can share more conferences using yeah, deep, deep, <laughs> deep video technology. Of course. Of course. <laughs> excellent, excellent presentation, Julian. Uh, we, can talk, we can talk the rest of the day about this kind of uh, technology. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, we have the impression there is a lot uh, coming uh, in the future in, in movies, in, in, in uh, industrial applications, and also risks. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of research uh, uh, is, uh, going on and perhaps more students, uh, graduate students uh, focusing on this and that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Uh, I, I really appreciate your, your, your time and, and your knowledge and, and I, I'm sure there, there is a lot of uh, questions in the chat so people is, is, is putting attention to what's going on in your field. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, at back